of you. All right. Hi, everyone. We'll get started pretty quickly because we've got a lot to cover today. So great to meet you all. My name is Courtney Cooperman. I'm a housing advocacy organizer at NLIHC. I use she, her pronouns. Welcome to our membership orientation. We're so excited to have you here. While we're waiting for people to keep filing in from the waiting room, we're actually gonna create a map of um, everyone we have here. So you can visit the link that's in the chat and drop a pin to let us know where you're calling in from. And if you're having any trouble with that, um, let us know, but you press the big plus button and then add your location into that. All right, I see some pins being dropped. Awesome. Yeah, we're starting to get a lot of pins being dropped. Um, so if you're, yeah, if you just hopped in, um, we could drop that link in the chat one more time. People can continue to drop the pin with where they're calling in from. And by the end of the call, we're, we'll have this really great map of where, where everyone's calling in from. Um, so we'll, we'll keep that link going in the chat. And it's really exciting to see where everyone's coming from. I think this reflects that NLIHC has a geographically diverse membership base, which of course you'll continue to hear about throughout the call. Before we get started, just wanted to give a few housekeeping notes. The presentation slides and the recording will be available on our website. We also have a closed captioner, so there is a transcript available as well. And within the next few days, you'll get an email with the recording and the slides. And of course, we want this to be interactive. So we encourage you to put questions and comments in the chat box throughout the call, but please stay muted unless you're called on. All right, so this orientation is designed to introduce you to NLIHC's team, to our work, how you can get more involved and what it means to be a member. If you're here, you're probably a new member of NLIHC, a new staff person at a member organization, or maybe you're someone who's involved with our network but hasn't taken the step to officially become a member yet. First, we'll discuss NLIHC's history to give you a sense of where we came from as an organization and how we got to where we are today. We'll review some key terminology that we use when we talk about housing policy, which will be helpful for getting involved with our advocacy. We'll also provide a brief overview of NLIHC's staff structure and each team's primary focus. We'll review our policy priorities and campaigns, some of the research reports that will enable you to be a more effective advocate and discuss the role of our network in advocating for change at the federal level. We'll talk about the benefits and opportunities of membership, ways to get involved, upcoming events, and we'll leave plenty of time for Q&A throughout. And instead of just telling you all about why membership matters, we'll feature a panel of our active members who will talk about why they joined NLIHC and how they've been involved with our work. But first, we want to get to know you. So if you click the next link in the chat, you'll be taken to another Padlet. So kind of like the map, um, but instead of a map, it's gonna be text boxes. You can press the big pink plus button in the bottom right-hand corner on that page and type your answer to the question, what housing policy issues do you care about? You can also add a heart or comment on other people's answers. So we'll give everyone a few minutes to add their responses on what housing policy issues they care about. And if you're having any issues with that, um, with the tech, let us know. And seeing some great ones, ending homelessness, tenants' rights, affordable housing. Again? Oh, yeah, so we'll drop a link on this. So this link that says padlet.com, um, the one that was just dropped, you can hop on here and um, press the big pink plus button on the bottom right corner to add a uh, housing policy issue you care about. And you can heart other people's. I'm seeing people hearting other answers, which is great. Yeah, so I'm seeing ending poverty, housing affordability, tenants' rights, fighting voucher discrimination, 
lead safety, housing access for multicultural communities and language access, quality housing, housing for people with disabilities, accessibility of home ownership, affordable housing development, permanent, permanent affordable housing. Yeah, there's a lot of really great ones on here. So you can keep interacting um, on this Padlet. This will stay available throughout. Um, yeah, really, really great ones. And for the most part, these fall under the umbrella of NLIHC's mission, which of course brings us to NLIHC's mission. NLIHC's mission is to achieve racially and socially equitable public policy that ensures people with the lowest incomes have quality homes that are accessible and affordable in communities of their choice. Our focus is public policy at the federal level, not in state legislatures or city councils, although we keep up with what our members and partners are doing at the state and local level and highlight that for our national network. We make sure that local advocates have the research and tools to support their work, but we don't have the capacity to do local technical assistance or local social services besides connecting people with resources in their own communities. We're also dedicated to meeting the needs of low income renters and people experiencing homelessness. So while many of our partners do excellent work on homeownership opportunities for first time home buyers, this is not an area of focus for NLIHC. NLHC was founded in 1974 by Cushing Dolbear. She founded the coalition in response to the Nixon administration's moratorium on funding for federal housing programs. Back then, it might be hard to believe, but there was actually a surplus of homes that were affordable and available. Homelessness as it exists today didn't exist at that time because there were enough housing options that people with the lowest incomes could afford. When the Nixon administration announced the moratorium, Dolbear organized a group of people who cared deeply about ensuring that those housing opportunities for the lowest income people continued to exist. At that time, the organization was called the Ad Hoc Low Income Housing Coalition. A few years later, a sister organization was created that was called the Low Income Housing Information Service. Ad Hoc was all about advocacy, educating policymakers and the public about housing issues, and the Low Income Housing Information Service worked with groups on the ground to support these state and local advocacy efforts. The Low Income Housing Information Service was incorporated in 1975 as a 501c3 or nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Ad Hoc was incorporated as the National Low Income Housing Coalition in 1978, and in 1996, the two merged under the NLIHC name. We continue all of the work that these two organizations did, public education, research, policy analysis, outreach, and field organizing. There are many national organizations that work on federal housing policy, but NLIHC's mission is what sets us apart. We're the only national organization focused solely on the housing needs of the lowest income people. So what do we mean when we talk about the lowest income people? That brings us to some key terminology. When we use the term lowest incomes, we're talking about households that make 30% or less of the area median income, or AMI. AMI is a value calculated by HUD, or the Department of Housing and Urban Development, for every region of the country, and is the value used to determine income eligibility for federal housing programs. To be considered middle income, a household makes 81% or more of AMI. To be considered low income, a household makes 51 to 80% of AMI a very low income household makes 31 to 50% of AMI, and extremely low income households make below 30% of AMI or below the federal poverty line. You may be asking, what does it even mean for a home to be affordable? In the housing world, affordability is defined relative to a household's own income. We consider housing to be affordable when a household is spending no more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. When a household is spending more than that, it is considered cost burdened. And when a household pays more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities, it is severely cost burdened. Being cost burdened or severely cost burdened puts people at a greater risk of homelessness and forces renters to make impossible choices between paying for housing and other basic needs like food and healthcare. Another useful term to know is fair market rent, which is a value calculated by HUD for every region. It estimates the rental cost of a modest apartment 
and is used to determine payment standards for federal voucher programs. NLIHC's goals are to preserve existing federally assisted homes and housing resources, expand the supply of low-income housing, and establish housing stability as the primary purpose of federal low-income housing policy. We believe strongly in our research, the insights of our partners who work directly in their communities, and the lived expertise of low-income renters. We know what the problems are, and we know what the solutions are. All we lack is the political will to fund those solutions. So everything that we do is around reaching that goal of funding the programs that can end housing poverty. Every team at NLIHC is an essential part of the whole that comes together to better understand, advocate for, and educate the public about these solutions. Now we're going to move into a quick overview of our staff so you can see how all of those pieces fit together. And here we have coming up a beautiful org chart put together by our comms team. We'll send out the slides afterwards so you can browse through specific staff people. But for everyone in this call, the most important person for you to know is the housing advocacy organizer for your state who can always connect you with members of other teams. We have an incredible team here at NLIHC. Diane Yantel, our president and CEO, is our fearless leader. You've probably seen her speak at congressional hearings or read her quotes in outlets like the New York Times. Our COO, Paul Keeley, leads the administration and op administrative and operations team, which keeps everything running smoothly. Our field team, so that's us on the call, is the first line of communication with members like you. Every state is assigned an organizer that updates our members and partners in those states about federal policy, keeps up with state and local developments that we can highlight for a national audience in our calls and publications, answers your questions and connects you to other NLIHC staff when there's someone else who might be better equipped to answer your question. We speak on our members' calls and conferences and we manage some of the administrative aspects of membership. We mobilize our base to take part in federal advocacy and build new relationships across the affordable housing movement. We've seen time and time again but our capacity to mobilize a diverse, energized base of supporters is what sets us apart from other organizations that do policy and research. The field team consists of field director Joey Lindstrom and our team of housing advocacy organizers, Brooke Shipwright, Sydney Battencourt, Gabby Ross, and me, Courtney Cooperman. We'll also have another organizer, Lindsay Duvall, joining our team at the end of the month. Um, so you'll see she's on this org chart as well, and she'll be joining us uh, at the end of the month. Our policy team, led by Sarah Sadian, tracks and analyzes key housing legislation and regulations, educates federal policymakers, testifies before Congress, and provides policy updates in our calls with members and partners. If you've been on our calls, you've definitely heard a wonderful update from Sarah. Our research team, led by Andrew Arend, produces our annual research reports, The Gap and Out of Reach, and specialized research briefs on topics ranging from disaster recovery, to emergency rental assistance, to the low-income housing tax credit. And we'll get more into the details of our research on a later slide. Our communications team, led by Jen Butler, conveys our message to the public, liaises with traditional media, manages our social media presence, and makes sure that all of our publications are eye-catching and widely distributed. If you follow us on Twitter, you've seen the impact of our wonderful comms team. Opportunity Starts at Home, led by Mike Kaprowski, is our multi-sector housing campaign, focused on bringing in organizations that primarily focus on issues other than housing to advocate for solutions to the housing affordability crisis. And ERASE, or Ending Rental Arrears to Stop Evictions, is a project led by NLIHC that focuses on ensuring that federal emergency rental assistance reaches those it is intended to help in an equitable way and prevents evictions. Sarah Gallagher leads the ERASE project. So there's a quick overview of the NLIHC team. Before I hand it over to Joey for the next section, we'll pause and see if anyone has any questions about our history, our mission, our key terminology, or the structure of our staff. If you have a question, you can type it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself right now. We'll have more time for questions when we get into the policy and research section too. So this is not your only opportunity for questions. So not seeing any questions, um, I do see a report that all home shares. So I'll definitely uh, be sure to check that out. Um, but not seeing any additional questions, I will pass it on to Joey. 
<clears throat> thank you so much, Courtney, uh, for that excellent information. Uh, and thanks for handing it over to me. Um, everyone, I am Joey Lindstrom. I am the field director at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. I have been uh, working on the field team for uh, nine years. So uh, many of you, I think, have had an opportunity to uh, meet me or interact with me, and that's been great. Uh, for those of you who are new members, uh, I'm going to walk you through our research um, publications and then some of our policy priorities. And I want to make sure we get through everything in order to have time for questions at the end. Um, so I might speak just a little bit fast. Um, feel free to drop questions in the chat box as we go along. So uh, on the matter of research, as Courtney mentioned, National Low Income Housing Coalition produces two signature research reports each year, the gap and out of reach. The first of which documents the stark disparities between the needs of renter households and the number of units that are affordable and available to them. It also gets into housing cost burdens and breaks it down into each income level. Next slide, please. Um, I believe Gabby just dropped into the chat box the link to the GAP report page on our website, um, and you definitely can find it also on this slide. Um, but the GAP report is where we really highlight that extremely low-income people are those who have the greatest housing needs of everyone in our in our nation, in, our, in all of our communities. Uh, nationally, as you can see here, there are only 37 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 extremely low-income renter households. This means there is an overall shortage of 6.8 million rental homes affordable and available to extremely low income people. And when I'm using the term available, I don't just mean it's affordable and empty such that someone can move in. That means it's affordable and the particular rental home is not being uh, occupied by somebody in a higher income category. So there's currently a shortage of 6.8 million throughout the country. And as Courtney mentioned earlier, earlier at the time of President Nixon's housing uh, spending moratorium in 1974, we actually had a surplus of affordable and available rental homes for extremely low income people. And again, the shortage is now at 6.8 million people. Before, when we talked about cost burdens, uh, we defined them as a renter paying more than 30% of their income on rent and utilities. And as you might recall, severe cost burdens defined as a renter paying more than half of their income on rent and utilities. And throughout the nation, we find that 70% or of the nation's 10.8 million extremely low income households are in fact severely cost burdened, paying more than 50% of their income for rent. This is more than any other income category. Uh, so when you hear people trying to tell you that the real need is for middle income housing or for workforce housing, um, the gap report is where you can go to determine and to clearly see that in the reality is in fact, uh, that it is the poorest people who have the greatest housing needs. Next slide. Another way that we really indicate that it's the lowest income people who should be the uh, priority of our um, policy interventions is the out of reach report. Uh, out of reach calculates every year the hourly housing wage that a renter must earn in order to afford a modest rental home in every community in the United States. The report finds that there is no state, metropolitan area or county in the United States where a worker earning the minimum wage can afford a modest two bedroom rental home at fair market rents if they are working just a standard 40 hour work week. The national housing wage uh, to afford a one bedroom apartment is $20 and 40 cents. And for a two bedroom apartment it is $24 and 90 cents. These numbers of course can be broken down by county and by state. And if you click on the state uh, on the out of reach report, uh, I think there's a link in the chat box right now, um, you can go to the state page which breaks it down county by county. For larger metropolitan areas, you can actually get the housing wage for every individual zip code. These two research reports are primarily what inform NLIHC's policy priorities. We're focused on housing solutions for the lowest income renters because that's where the data shows the greatest need. It's where we see the starkest shortage of affordable and available homes and the most severe cost burden. Uh, an additional research note that I'll add because I think it might be helpful to many of you is that NLIHC also partners with the Public and Affordable Housing Research Corporation or PARC on the National Housing Preservation Database. And in this database, uh, we provide a map uh, of the nation's subsidized housing stock that includes information about subsidy end dates, natural disaster risks, and other threats to the supply of affordable housing. So for your community or for your neighborhood, you can bring up the map and you can identify which buildings have housing subsidies attached to them and when those housing subsidies are likely to expire. The website is preservationdatabase.org and I believe Gabby has posted that in the chat box. Next slide, please. 
So the policy solutions that NLIHC supports uh, really are grounded in the data work that our excellent research team does. Nationwide and in most metropolitan areas, uh, the data show that the housing shortage is really concentrated more than any place uh, for the lowest income people, ex specifically extremely low income people um, and not middle income people. For this reason, we advocate for federal investments that meet the needs that the regular private housing market cannot meet on its own. And we believe that resources should be deeply targeted. We also have as a bedrock uh, sort of core belief in our policy pursuits that homelessness is primarily a housing problem. Homelessness as we know it, it's important to remember, didn't really exist uh, until the late 70s and the early 80s. Uh, as part of urban renewal, cities throughout the country in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, were raising and demolishing single room occupancy buildings and other housing options that were specifically for extremely low income people. President Nixon's moratorium on housing spending uh, put a virtual stop on the expansion of public housing, which was codified in the 90s with the Faircloth Amendment. And the Reagan administration deeply cut the Department of Housing and Urban Development budget each and every year, leading in part to the explosion of homelessness that occurred in the 1980s. So as solutions we advocate for, uh, for expanding housing options and expanding housing subsidies, we believe deeply in permanent supportive housing as the best model for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, permanent supportive housing or PSH integrates housing assistance and voluntary supportive services that connect people with community-based healthcare, uh, addiction treatment, skills development, job training, and so forth. This model treats housing as the foundation that makes it possible to address all the other needs such as mental or physical health. Um, and the best approach, as many of you know, is housing first because when people have housing, they can more successfully address their various other barriers. Next, we'll get into some of the specific legislation that NLIHC is supporting and prioritizing right now. Next slide, please. In 2021, NLIHC launched the Housed Campaign for Universal, Stable, Affordable Housing. Mission of the Housed Campaign is to advance anti-racist policies and achieve the large-scale sustained investments and reforms that are necessary to ensure that renters with the lowest incomes have an affordable place to call home four pillars of the campaign. First, to bridge the gap between incomes and housing costs by expanding rental assistance to every eligible household. Remember that right now, only one in every four household eligible for rental assistance actually receives it. The other three out of four households have to remain on waiting lists for years and years and years. These tools to bridge the gap between incomes and housing costs uh, mostly are going to be things like housing choice vouchers or renters tax credits. The second pillar of the House campaign is about expanding and preserving the supply of rental homes affordable and accessible to people with the lowest incomes. There is no state nor congressional district in the United States with enough supply of affordable homes for families with the lowest incomes. And for this reason, we, pro we propose expanding the National Housing Trust Fund and various other um, production uh, funding revenue, fund, excuse me, funding programs through HUD. Uh, we also propose, as the third pillar of housed, providing emergency rental assistance to households in crisis by creating a national housing stabilization fund. This would be similar to the emergency rental assistance that's been um, going on in states throughout the country during the coronavirus pandemic. Millions of households are one financial shock away from economic hardship that could quickly spiral out of control and result in homelessness. An emergency rental assistance uh, stabilization fund would be essential in preventing uh, people from entering the shelter system. We also, as our fourth pillar in the House campaign, uh, include strengthening and enforcing renter protections to reduce the power imbalance between renters and landlords that puts renters at risk of housing instability and homelessness. So there's more than two dozen pieces of key legislation that fall under the purview of the House campaign, which you can browse at the link that Gabby will post in the chat right now. Uh, this past year, most of our advocacy on the House campaign is focused on the Build Back Better Act, which is a huge piece of legislation that includes truly really historic housing investments. The House of Representatives passed a version of the Build Back Better Act that included $154 billion in affordable housing resources and, including, uh, and included several of the House campaign's top priorities, $65 billion for public housing repairs and uh, rehabilitation, $25 billion for rental assistance, and 15 billion for the National Housing Trust Fund. You can read more about our Build Back Better priorities at the link that Gabby will share in the chat. 
It's certainly true that our advocacy was critical to keeping those housing investments in the bill when the overall price tag was scaled down from 3.5 trillion, as the bill was initially conceived, to 1.75 trillion. We organized a sign-on letter with more than 1,800 state and local and national organizations in support of our priorities. And this letter uh, in, all, was sent to members of Congress. But further, we encouraged members of Congress to publicly support the housing investments with a dear colleague letter, putting their name to state that they specifically support these housing interventions in Build Back Better. I'll add my thanks to the many, many of you who were involved in this advocacy by reaching out to your members of Congress about this crucial bill. You can read the sign on letter uh, in the link, at the link that is posted in the chat. Our advocacy continues into 2022 because as most of you know, Senator Joe Manchin has decided to be opposed to the Build Back Better Act. And that means it can't pass the Senate. Um, his opposition to the bill has pushed congressional leadership into yet one more round of negotiations, and it might create yet one more smaller bill. We're pushing for members of Congress to weigh in with their leadership and ensure that the House campaign priorities remain in any final bill that passes through the Senate. You can reach out to your members of Congress using the template email at the link that's being shared in the chat now. Next slide, please. Thank you. Our advocacy for Build Back Better builds on two decades of support for the National Housing T Trust Fund. As many of you know, NLIHC played a crucial role in devising and then establishing the National Housing Trust Fund. The National Housing Trust Fund was officially established in the Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008. And the first, amount, the first allocations went out to states actually in 2016. NLIHC continues to monitor the, impa monitor the impact of the Housing Trust Fund and advocate for more funding, including through Build Back Better. The Housing Trust Fund uh, at this point is the first new federal housing resource in a generation that is exclusively targeted to building, preserving, and rehabilitating housing for people with the lowest incomes. As we've mentioned, the Housing Trust Fund is our preferred vehicle for construction, rehabilitation, preservation, and operation of affordable housing because at least it's a deeply targeted. At least 75% of housing trust fund dollars must serve extremely low income households. And the remainder can go only as high as very low income households or 50% AMI. An overall 90% of housing trust fund resources must be spent on rental housing, which means it can't um, overly emphasize home ownership in any state. By, bon by contrast, many other federal programs, indeed most of them that were created throughout the 80s and 90s and the earliest part of the century, um, focus on higher income households or uh, focus on home ownership. We're also strongly supportive of investments in public housing to meet the $70 billion capital needs backlog. Each year, the United States loses 10,000 to 15,000 public housing homes due to disrepair and dilapidation. And as we saw in New York City last week, the consequences of that ne neglect can be deadly. Indeed, the massive fire that broke out in the Bronx might have been prevented had Congress been funding the Capital Housing Fund and giving to PHAs the money that they need to make repairs. Next slide, please. Beyond Build Back Better and beyond the House campaign, each year NLIHC also advocates for our priorities in the federal budget. NLIHC does this by convening the Campaign for Housing and Community Development Funding, or CHCDF. This is a broad coalition of advocates working to maximize resources for housing and community development in the federal budget. Housing programs have been significantly underfunded for decades. Again, only one in four households eligible for housing assistance receives it. We advocate for increased resources for housing choice vouchers, public housing, project-based rental assistance, homeless assistance grants, and building and preserving tribal and rural housing as well. While CHCDF is a broad coalition that focuses on maximizing the top line spending number for housing and community development, NLIHC also advocates to fund our top priorities. For example, this year we are pushing for passage uh, of the house spending proposal that would fund rental assistance for an additional 125,000 households. You can reach out to your member of Congress in support of these increased resources and the federal budget at the link that Gabby is dropping into the chat box. Many of you on this call asked in registering for uh, the meeting about specific programs and uh, a couple that were brought up were affordable senior housing and housing for uh, people with disabilities. These are programs that we care about very deeply given how many of the lowest income renters are seniors and of course people with disabilities. Accessibility is also a key part of our mission. The data show that 18% of extremely low income renter households are headed by someone with a disability and an additional 30% 
our households of senior, uh, senior citizens. In all the work that we do, we advocate for housing that is not only affordable, but also accessible, and to ensure that housing meets the needs of people with disabilities. For this reason, our priorities for the federal budget very much include supportive 202, or Section 202, supportive housing for the elderly program, and Section 811, supportive housing for persons with disabilities program. Section 202 provides uh, funds to nonprofit organizations to develop and operate housing for very low income seniors. Um, and it also includes uh, access to community based services, allowing seniors to age in place without institutionalization. Section 811, meanwhile, provides funding to develop and subsidize rental housing with supportive services for very low and extremely low income adults with disabilities. The program has been reformed in recent years to expand integrated housing opportunities. The Build Back Better Act includes 500 million for Section 2, 202 and 500 million for Section 811. We hope to see these resources approved in addition to the maximum possible funding level in FY22. I also want to take a moment since we're talking about the federal budget and some of the housing solutions we believe in uh, to quickly mention that uh, some of you have raised in various conversations and in registering for this meeting um, where NLIHC stands on social housing. Um, social housing is a really novel approach that works in many European communities and, uh, and it could work in, uh, in many American communities as well. Um, but our big concern is that most social housing proposals involve eliminating income targeting and allowing the programs to serve people at all housing levels. Our experience is that when that happens, the housing is made affordable not to people with the deepest needs. Um, we believe the better solution is to support and expand public housing, reminding you that more than 60% of renter households in the US are currently eligible for public housing. Um, public housing is also uh, locally controlled, and, though it is federally funded. And this uh, is one of the key features of social housing as well, community ownership and operations of the housing. So we're strongly in support of making sure that we have uh, more and more public housing so that everyone is on the waiting, who's on the waiting list can have a home that they can afford. We highly recommend browsing the Advocates Guide, which we'll discuss in more detail later, uh, where you can hear more about all of these programs. I'm gonna quickly shoot through um, three of NLIHC's featured campaigns that have important policy implications. Um, so on the next slide, we should have the Disaster Housing Recovery Coalition. And for those of you who don't know, the DHRC is a coalition of more than 850 national, state, and local organizations, including many who work directly with communities recovering from disasters. Um, the DHRC provides recommendations to Congress, FEMA, and HUD on disaster recovery legislation and regulations. And the primary um, priorities for the DHRC right now are the Reforming Disaster Recovery Act and the Housing Survivors of Major Disasters Act. The Reforming Disaster Recovery Act is a bipartisan bill that would permanently authorize the CDBGDR, Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program, which provides flexible grants to help cities, counties, and states recover from presidentially declared disasters um, and to rebuild affordable housing. Um, Gabby's going to drop a link into the chat box that, uh, that gives you an opportunity to sign on to a letter in support of the Reforming Disaster Recovery Act. The Housing Survivors of Major Disasters Act, meanwhile, addresses significant title documentation challenges that have prevented thousands of eligible disaster survivors from receiving FEMA assistance. The bill would permanently codify new FEMA policy that allows disaster survivors to self-certify ownership of their homes when they do not have other documentation. And it allows survivors to submit a broader range of documentation to prove occupancy or ownership. Next slide, please. So this is just a glimpse of our priorities. Um, there are several other things that we're working on, including the establishment of a new renter's tax credit, national housing stabilization fund, um, anti-eviction measures, such as just cause eviction protections or a national um, right to counsel. Uh, so there are several things that are specific to tenant protections. And beyond that, we also want to expand fair housing enforcement so that people with vouchers um, or that people with a certain veteran status or sexual, sexual orientation can be protected as well. We're also working on housing opportunities for uh, renters who are returning from incarceration and um, increasing mobility of housing choice vouchers by expanding the and implementing the HUD small area fair market rents. Um, really quickly, just want to mention our ERASE project, which you heard about earlier. This is ending rent arrears to stop evictions. Um, we, uh, we 
led this uh, drive throughout 2020 and including this year to successfully get Congress to allocate $47 billion in emergency rental assistance to help renters pay their back rent and to stave off evictions once the eviction moratorium expired. The ERASE project has three key pillars for ERA programs, um, that these programs should be visible, accessible, and preventive. Um, we've developed an ERASE checklist and an assessment so advocates like yourselves can determine whether your local programs meet these standards. And Gabby's going to drop that checklist into the chat box now. We also provide, next slide, uh, tools to track hundreds of ERA programs that list program features and overall spending numbers. Um, our ERASE project has published many research reports and uh, has provided written comments to the Treasury Department with recommendations to incorporate in their guidance for the uh, administration of programs. And Gabby will drop in the ERA dashboard now as well. Um, the, ER, the ERASE project also includes a cohort of many state and local grantees uh, to whom we've provided resources uh, to ensure that their local ERA funds are being um, distributed to the people who need them most. And then the final campaign of NLIHCs that I just want to highlight quickly is the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. This is where we uh, look at the intersection of housing affordability and various other advocacy sectors that are um, going on prominently throughout the nation. We launched this campaign in cooperation with the National Alliance to End Homelessness, the Children's Health Watch, and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, all as key founding partners. You can browse the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign's fact sheets on how, um, for example, environmental justice or childcare issues or uh, healthcare or education are all bolstered when we achieve better housing stability for our communities. Um, the fact sheets are in the chat box now. And I'll also share that Opportunity Starts at Home, much like the Erase Project, um, is, ad is organizing uh, various state partners and state grantees throughout the country in support of this work. And the state campaigns are being linked in the chat box here as well. And uh, that is my uh, kind of overview of research and policy that we think new members should be aware of. Um, Courtney, do we want to take questions before we pass it over to Sydney? Yeah, we've gotten a few questions in the chat. So why don't we take those and then we'll pass it along. Um, so we have one question. Um, about um, zoning deregulation and incentives mm -hmm. to private equity investors. Um, what are we what are we doing about that? How does our research and policy address that? Uh, I think those are kind of two different questions. Um, number one is we're we're very in favor of zoning deregulation and up zoning. We think that um, the elimination of single family zoning, as was done by the city of Minneapolis and the state of Oregon, and a version of which was done by the state of California as well, um, this is a trend that we'd like to see happening more and more and more. Because one of the things that we need to do to get ourselves out of our um, rental housing shortage is make sure that more and more rental housing is being built, and zoning codes really get in the way of that. Um, the second part of the question was about uh, private equity funds buying up properties in communities uh, throughout the country. Um, that's, a, that's a growing concern, of course, and there are different communities that are passing measures to prevent this from happening. I think one of the best, it, it, it's, it's playing out more at a local level than anywhere else. I think one of the best methods to prevent it is to have a robust and large community land bank, whereby um, properties that have been um, foreclosed upon or have been um, subject to tax seizures and so forth um, are not made available to um, private equity firms, but are rather put into a community land bank um, where then it's made first available to nonprofit organizations and so forth. Uh, a right of first of refusal to community-based nonprofits for, um, for certain properties can be really helpful as well. And at the federal level, what we do is we try to make sure that housing trust fund resources or home, home program resources are available for community communities who want to execute these kinds of solutions. Is there another question? Yes, um, we also got a question about who to contact for an entity that offers financing for people with disabilities to build accessible housing, given the lack of options. Um, so what kind of work is happening on that sort of housing development and where could someone reach out um, to get more information about that? 
Yeah, once you really get into using a lot of these subsidy programs to actually develop the housing, it can get pretty complex. Um, there are a couple of organizations that come to mind. The first is Technical Assistance Collaborative uh, is really good at providing, well, technical assistance to organizations that are getting started and, and um, providing um, new uh, housing options and, and working in development. There are also training modules on how to use certain subsidy programs that are available through NeighborWorks America or through the National Development Council uh, that you might want to take a look at as well. Great, and we have one more question. How does NLIHC address the housing crisis of homeless youth and unaccompanied minors? Uh, we're very supportive of HUD programs that are specific to homeless youth, and a lot of those are run through um, homeless assistance grants in many cases. Um, we, we work in partnership on anything with homelessness uh, with our close partners at the National Alliance to End Homelessness, and um, we generally regard in our work that, um, that homeless youth um, need to be given the same opportunities for housing um, as uh, homeless adults to the extent that the law will allow it. And I realize in many states, um, the options for youth to, for example, sign a lease or live independently um, are, re are related to you know, what a parent allows and so forth. Um, so we really work closely with our partners on national homelessness policy uh, to pursue funding options that local communities can make available or can better use, excuse me. Thanks. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass it along to Sydney for our next section. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Joey. Um, my name is Sydney Betancourt. I use she, her pronouns. I'm also a housing advocacy organizer, um, but I also go by Sid. Um, and I'm just gonna go briefly over racial equity, which isn't like a campaign within NLIHC, but it is um, kind of like a, something that cuts across all the work that we do at the coalition. And we know that systemic racism is something that um, impacts like every aspect of the housing market in the United States and the racial disparities that we see um, happening on the ground are no accident, um, such as who is cost burden and who is extremely low income and who um, faces evictions, it's usually the product of a racist history and ongoing racial discrimination that NLIHC is committed to dismantling. Last year, we convened uh, an equity action team, which I am a part of and I work alongside um, Renee Willis, who is our Senior Vice President for Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, um, as, long, um, as well as some other folks that are on NLIHC's team. And they developed an inclusion diversity equity and anti-racism action plan, also known as an idea plan, uh, and it addresses NLIHC's internal work to create a more inclusive culture um, internally, as well as external efforts to ensure that racial equity is at the heart of our policy recommendations, our programming, and our engagement with um, our partners and yourselves. Uh, and some of this work includes building the capacity of communities of color, prioritizing um, Black and people of color led um, and Indigenous people of color led organizations in our grant making, bolstering our work to empower resident leaders, and doing even more um, in corporate, to incorporate people with lived experience in our policy decisions. And like I said, um, Renee Willis is the leader of these efforts and she does a lot of collaborating with our members um, and folks who um, are also like stakeholders to bring racial equity to the forefront of our work. One of like the most exciting pieces of our work, which um, y'all see here on the screen is the Dots Home Game, which is free to download on Steam, which is like a gaming um, platform and also um, on your app on your phone and it explores race and housing in America through the eyes of a black family in Detroit. Next slide please. Thank you. So now I'm going to switch the quick gears, uh, switch gears to advocacy. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to talk about what it means and how NLIHC mobilizes our network. The field team's primary, um, primary focus is to provide you with the resources to become an effective housing advocate. So what does it mean when we talk about advocating for something? Advocacy is a term that we use to describe educational activities and organizing aimed at supporting a particular goal or outcome. So usually this means educating the general public, um, including our members, but it also includes educating political leaders. 
And the reason we advocate is to push for the changes that we wanna see in our communities and we wanna hold our elected officials accountable. It's important to recognize that we're all experts in our own ways based on our experience um, and in the ways in which we um, can change like the status quo conditions of low income housing and society more broadly. It's our duty to advocate for better. Advocates' um, voices carry weight with the public and elected officials, and as we all know, the primary job of elected officials is to represent the sentiments of a community through legislative action, and if large groups of their constituents are contacting them about a particular issue, they take notice. NLHC staff may have some say in um, like what we have with like our data, but ultimately elected officials are going to listen to your stories and like what you think, not what we think. So that's why um, constituents are the ones with like the power to vote their legislators in and out their office of office. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, we want you all to know that advocacy works. When we talk to staffers and legislators, we hear again and again that our advocacy is important. And it doesn't have to be a full-time responsibility. Um, it can, we can make you um, some tools that'll make it a lot easier for you. Sometimes it may be a more involved activity such as coming to DC um, and doing a lobby day. But more often it's a lot easier than that. You can sign your organization onto one of our letters or call of actions. You can send an email with the text that we've drafted for you. And you can also participate in a tweet storm or another coordinated action that we do together. Next slide, please. I wanna go over calls to action really quickly because they're really important in the work that we do at NLHC. They're also known as CTAs. Um, and it's a communication with the general public that reflects a view on specific legislation and encourages people to contact their legislative representatives or staff in order to influence legislation. And so there's multiple parts to CTA, so I'll break that down for you. Each CTA will usually have instructions for you um, and how to do it. As you'll see on the screen, you can see this one has specific instructions. It'll usually ask you to do one of the following. So you can contact your member of Congress by phone or email. You can create a personalized email to an appropriate staffer, unless you already know who, um, or you have a relationship with that congressional office, or you can sign on your organization to a letter to endorse a policy proposal. And when we share a CTA, we also encourage you to share it widely with your networks. You're also encouraged to adapt it to your organization or your community so that it can be shared broadly with the same message. Next slide, please. We also um, received a great question in the registration report about communications and social media collaboration or co-branding. And this is a common feature in our advocacy in pivotal moments like trying to pass Build Back Better. We will organize and participate in tweet storms. Um, you might've seen some of our work on Twitter around that, but our communications team does provide help with graphics um, and text and any other support that you might need. Um, we also have a toolkit for Build Back Better, and I'm going to have Gabby drop that link in the chat for you shortly if you need inspiration on how um, to interact online and what you can do in terms of media. And as you can see here on the slide, we did work with the West Virginia Coalition and Homelessness um, on Build Back Better um, billboards to pressure Senator Manchin to support the bill. If you're interested in social media co-branding, you can reach out to your housing advocacy organizer and we'll put you in touch with our communications team. Awesome. Next slide, thank you. So now I'm gonna go um, a little bit more in depth into our advocates guide. So we publish one every year and we're actually working on 2022s now. And it includes a history and background of several federal housing programs and how they're funded, how the programs work, basically anything you would like to know about the program, I promise you it'll be there. It's probably like this thick <laughs> of a book and um, you can also download it as a PDF online. Um, and we also have three other fact sheets that you can use for your states that are not in the advocates guide. So I'll be going over those um, with the next couple of slides. The first one is our preservation database fact sheet, which show you how many extremely low income subsidized units are expiring in the upcoming years. The next slide, please. You also have access to the state housing profile, and this looks at number of affordable homes needed for extremely low income renters and who those renters are. Next slide, please. 
And then you'll also have access to congressional, uh, congressional district profiles. And these ones just show renter statistics per each federal district. And these ones are especially useful when you're advocating because you can show these um, to your Congress members, especially those in the house, because they'll see how it affects their state or district. And you can find these resources on the housing needs by state section of your website at the link that Gabby just shared in the chat. Thank you. And then I'll just be going over our homes, our votes campaign. So we know that renters, especially low income renters are underrepresented among voters and it's critical for advocates to engage these renters and other low income people in the voting process to ensure that their interests are represented and that candidates are thinking about housing solutions. To achieve this, NLIHC created Our Homes, Our Votes, a nonpartisan campaign to register, educate, and mobilize more low-income renters and affordable housing advocates to be involved in voting. We work to elevate the conversation about affordable housing in the 2020 presidential elections, and we are also kickstarting our 2022 <laughs> campaign for Our Homes, Our Votes in the 2022 um, midterms. And so to help our members carry out effective voter engagement efforts, we provide um, a complete toolkit online. Um, and there'll be more information coming on that as we update our website. And we'll also be having webinars um, so you can learn more about that. And then I'll pause to have any questions about our advocacy or our homes, our votes before handing it over to Gabby for the next section. I think we'll pass it straight to Gabby and then we'll collect all remaining questions for the end. And we're actually going to go um, for Gabby. Let's go straight to our panel and then we'll get to the end um, and cover some other stuff on membership. Um, so we have a really exciting group of members who are our panelists today. So we can hop to the slides of the panel. <clears throat> Thanks, Courtney. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gabby. I'm housing advocacy organizer here at NLIHC. Um, so we're going to have some um, current members um, speak about uh, their memberships, how their experience with memberships, um, and how they value being a member. Our first panelist, we have Michael Dahl from Homeline, Minnesota. And I'll hand it over to you, Michael. Hello, my, am I... Am I on the screen? I want to, I'll, am I, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say um, thank you um, for this, uh, this, this um, presentation. And I want to tell uh, uh, Courtney, Joey, um, and, uh, and, and Sarah that you make me a better advocate. Um, National Long Housing Coalition makes me a better advocate. And I deeply appreciate the work that you, that you do. Um, I love the con the congressional district profiles. I think they make my advocacy with uh, with um, federal legislators much easier. And so, pointing out how few um, housing units are available to extremely low income households, I find some of the most valuable information that I get from from NLIHC. I also like the fact that your calls to action are often as well. You make them as easy as you can, um, and sometimes you get into Sometimes things have to get into the weeds, but you often make um, um, uh, advocacy work for um, for real people, and I appreciate that. And then, lastly, the fact that you're taking tenant tenant issues on more um, is something that has Homeline um, really uh, excited about the work of National Low Income Housing Coalition. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing um, your experience with the coalition. Um, our next panelist, we have Erica Bowman from Texas Housers. And I'll pass it off to you, Erica. I'm actually, I'm not sure if Erica is on right now unless she's oh. on the phone. Um, why don't we pass it to Eric? And then Erica, if you're if you're here on the phone, uh, you can unmute after Eric's turn. Okay, cool. Yes, yeah, so we'll pass it to Eric Novak from Praxis, our Prax, yeah, Praxis Consulting Group in Nevada. Thanks. Can you uh, see me, hear me? Yes. Great. Hi. Um, my name is Eric Novak. I'm president of Praxis Consulting Group in Reno, Nevada, which is a development finance consulting firm, and I'm a longtime National Income Housing Coalition member. I'm also on the board of the newly formed Nevada Housing Coalition, which is an active member of NLIHC. An LIHC membership is important to me for a number of reasons. Uh, as a long, lifelong houser, it allows me to stay in touch 
with what's going on at the national level and to bring some of that information and advocacy to Nevada. I attended the national conference in DC a few years ago when we still met in person and was so impressed by the diversity of the organization and by the strong participation of affordable housing tenants and residents of low-income communities in all of the events. It energized me for our housing work in Nevada. I've been especially appreciative of the support, funding, and technical assistance uh, that NLIHC has provided to us at the Nevada Housing Coalition. I think our success and growth over the last two years as a leading voice in housing in the state is greatly attributable to NLIHC, so thank you. Uh, finally, I wanna point out the important role of organizing and advocacy in housing. Uh, as, a finance, as finance consultants in what is a very technical field, we sometimes forget that the programs that we work with, the financing tools like the National Housing Trust Fund are the product of years of organizing and advocacy. So that's why I'm proud to be a member, thanks. Thank you, Eric, thank you for sharing. And finally, we have um, our last panelist for today, Mrs. Lorraine Brown from the 30, 334 East 92nd Street Tenants Association in New York. And I'll pass it over to you, Mrs. Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be part of the panel, but more importantly, a board member of the nonprofit coalition that is making a difference in empowering the low income housing resident. I just want to suggest a few things to all new members is to get to know your electeds, reach out to your local elected officials, as well as your national elected officials and advise him or her that you are a member of the coalition and that you will be reaching out to their offices for support from time to time. Establish a relationship with them. And when they do something for you or you appreciate a bill or a proposal, send a handwritten thank you note to let them know that you support their hard work. Secondly, understand the coalition's mission. Participate in tenant talk, which is very critical, and also call to action campaigns. And more importantly, stay abreast of the coalition's immediate needs. Partner with other residents locally and nationally. Share information with other residents, community partners, and more importantly, your PHA. Be sure to recruit new members, educate and motivate, and take advantage of the tools that they provide. The Advocate's Guide is your housing Bible. Use it. And I wish you the best. And if you ever need me, I'm just a phone call or an email away. And thank you for being part of this fine organization in which I'm so proud to be affiliated with. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Brown. And thank you to our amazing panel. Um, we are about to go over some features of membership, but um, we will be sending out this information to everybody. So if you have to hop off, that's totally fine. Um, you'll still um, have access to the information. So I just wanted to highlight um, our biannual magazine called Tenant Talk um, that focuses on uh, low income renters, um, spotlights their perspectives and mobilizes them to take part in federal advocacy. Um, recent themes of um, past editions of Tenant Talk include disability justice, civic engagement, racial justice, public housing, and gentrification. The resident, uh, the, excuse me, the resident editorial board of Tenant Talk approves the selection of each theme and offers input to the publication, making sure that the magazine reflects the experiences of those most directly affected by housing policy. And um, you can read on um, past issues of Tenant Talk in the link in the chat. Um, I also want to highlight um, our weekly newsletter, Memo to Members of Partners, which breaks down um, uh, federal legislation relevant to um, housing policy, as well as their administrative actions, summarizes the latest research from NLIHC and other institutions, and highlights our partners' activities at the state and local levels. 
Um, each week we provide a field update um, that shows what our, our state and local partners are doing. And we also um, ask people to, uh, or ask our partners to contribute a quote um, if it's a story relating to their state or area. Um, and if you wanna be highlighted in a memo, that's great. Um, just reach out to us. And Courtney will drop a link to the memo subscription in the chat. Yes. Um, so NLIHC has um, several working groups, uh, working group calls and, and webinars. Um, oh, I'm sorry, next slide. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. Um, we encourage you to join any of our webinars or working group calls. Um, these feature the um, House National Call where advocates across the country um, speak about um, affordable housing. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, it features affordable housing champions from Congress um, in, and it has in-depth legislative updates and research briefings from NLIHC staff and other organizations, as well as analyses of the latest treasury data on ERA distribution and field updates from our partners. And you can join the House National Call every Monday from 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern time and the link will be dropped in the chat. Um, and then we have Tenant Talk Live, which is geared towards low-income renters and also provides an opportunity for residents to connect with us and each other and also to share their experiences and to engage in uh, federal advocacy. And the link to Tenant Talk Live will be dropped in a chat and that takes place on the first Monday of every month, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. And then we have our House Campaign Legislative Working Group, um, which discuss, discusses the latest from Capitol Hill related to our campaign uh, priorities. And you can join the um, House Legislative Working Group every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And um, information for that will be dropped in the chat. And then we have our DHRC Working Group, um, which uh, hold, uh, provides updates um, from members on disaster recovery efforts across the country. It also shares best practices and also to stay up to date on the latest federal changes to, this, to disaster recovery response framework. You can join the DHRC working group every Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time and information will be dropped in the chat. Then we have our state and local implement implementation working group um, that provides opportunities to share lessons learned and best practices as organizations respond to the housing needs of people experiencing homelessness and the lowest income renters during the pandemic. You can join the state and local implement implementation call um, every other Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Information will be dropped in the chat. And lastly, we have a Puerto Rico working group, which has been meeting since hurricanes Irma and Maria devastated the islands and also um, through the recent earthquakes and now the pandemic. Um, this working group is facilitated by DHRC, but it is led by local advocates and organizations working in Puerto Rico. Information for that will be dropped in the chat. Okay. Um, getting involved in all these uh, webinars will really help um, you to participate in NL, NL, excuse me, NLIHC's work as a member. Okay, um, next slide. Um, a logistical note for membership, all members, um, in, individuals and organizations, um, your membership expires one year after the month in which you join. Um, as you approach your expiration date, you will hear from, you will hear from us about renewing your membership. You also have the option to set up recurring annual payments. So your membership will renew automatically as your expiration date approaches. Also, I want to um, highlight that the dues listed are only suggested amounts. Um, we don't want anyone to uh, be prevented from being a member um, because of the dues. So we, and we also encourage, and, uh, encourage you to recruit others to join the movement. And also, if you're at this event realizing that you get all of our emails and you go to our events, but you don't pay dues and you're wondering if you're a member, that's totally fine. Uh, we value everyone who takes part in our network, but only the organizations and individuals who pay annual membership dues are officially counted as members. If you're unsure of whether or not you're a member, um, please reach out to us. And our membership form will be dropped in the chat. And I wanna go over some uh, benefits of membership. Um, ma uh, NLIHC members receive free copies of the Advocate's Guide and discounted rates on print copies of Tenant Talk and our research reports. You'll also be connected with a housing advocacy organizer who will answer your questions, speak at your events, help interpret NLIHC resources, keep you in the loop on federal advocacy and connect you with other staff. Um, you will also receive a discounted rate to our housing policy forum and leadership awards reception and an opportunity to participate in our policy setting decisions. Instead of talking about, oh, sorry, excuse me. 
All right. So that was a brief overview of benefits to membership. Um, before we close out today, um, there's going to be one more Padlet dropped in the chat. Um, excuse me. And I also want to put on everyone's radar that our annual housing policy forum is coming up. The, uh, the forum is going to be virtually held on March 22nd and 23rd from 12.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, the registration link will also be dropped in the chat. And the following day, Thursday, March 24th, will be our virtual Capitol Hill Day. Also, save the date for our 2022 Housing Leadership Awards reception on Thursday, April 28th. Information for that will be dropped in the chat. And um, finally, our last Padlet, um, please write at least one way you're planning to be involved the, uh, with the coalition going forward. Okay. And thank you all for um, making the time to attend today. Um, we're excited to work with you and keep working with you if you've um, you know, been working with us. Um, we're also going to share our housing advocacy organizer map um, so you can know the point of contact for your state. And we'll, we'll follow up with these resources in the next few days. We'll send out um, PowerPoint as well as um, all the things we discussed in the um, presentation today. And um, Courtney will drop um, all of our emails in the chat. So if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Gabby. Um, so as we're closing out, I know we're a few minutes over time and really appreciate all of you staying on. So we have kind of a few things going on simultaneously. One, we have this Padlet where you can post the ways that you're committing um, to stay involved with us, which is really great. I think we have some great answers coming in there and in the chat. Um, we also, we know some people had dropped questions in that we didn't get a chance to get to. Um, and I know we're over time, but I think it's really important that we get to those questions. Um, so if you can stick around, let's um, try to get to some of those questions. And I see um, we have one hand raised right now. Um, Anindita, do you, do you want to come off mute and ask a question? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. This is my first uh, year of membership with your organization. Um, I'm a psychologist based out of Southern California, and um, the Section 8 housing is one of the housing that, uh, you know, with community mental health, we refer clients. It's been, it's been like difficult to get in because people say there's a lot of wait lists, um, long wait lists, and then after the pandemic, it's been even harder. And one of the issues that I'm seeing with clients is the long wait list. And number two, the housing for low income uh, families are in neighborhoods that are not necessarily the safe neighborhoods, because it seems like some of the more, you know, middle or higher SES neighborhoods don't want sort of the low income housing. So that's something that I've had to kind of work with people in terms of uh, living in these um, housing units that are not you know, sort of the safest. So I just was curious about your thoughts on that. That's that's kind of some of the things I've seen as a psychologist. Yeah, I think you're, thank you for sharing that. I think the experiences that you've had really touch on why we are advocating for the policies we're advocating for. So only one in four, I think as we mentioned, only one in four households that's eligible for federal rental assistance actually receives it. And you have these years long wait lists in some, in some places they're not even open for people to join those wait lists. So we advocate for a major expansion in rental assistance that would um, that would address that problem and help many people who are on those wait lists to get housing. Um, the issue of high opportunity neighborhoods and mobility is also one that we care a lot about um, and something that we would advocate for in addition to the expansion of rental assistance is banning source of income discrimination which mm -hmm. in states that don't have protections or cities or states that don't have protections allows landlords to discriminate against someone because they'd be paying with a voucher as opposed mm -hmm. to income from a job. And there are a patchwork of cities and states that have banned source of income discrimination, but federally um, it's still allowed. So if your state doesn't protect against it, um, then it's still a problem. So that's, that's a big policy priority for us, for sure. Thank Morning, you so much. Here. 
Oh yeah, and, and I'll let Joey chime in with more on that. Oh, sorry, uh, um, but I, I think um, uh, one, uh, two things that are relevant to this. Number one is uh, you saw on the slide earlier, we're working also on small area fair market rents. Uh, what mm -hmm. that really means is that for an area like Southern California, you wouldn't have one fair market rent for like Los Angeles. You would have it for individual zip codes mm -hmm. um, or neighborhoods. And this would allow the voucher to pay more in neighborhoods that are otherwise too expensive for a voucher to be used, right? Um, mm -hmm. And there's also a bill that our Opportunity Starts at Home campaign is working on, um, and I'm blanking on the name right now, but you can find it on opportunityhome.org. It's a mm -hmm. bill initially offered by Senator Van Hollen, and it is specifically to create something called opportunity vouchers that are mm -hmm. specific to be used in higher income areas for low income people. Um, and so that's a really important piece of legislation too. Um, but I mean, uh, one of the things that happens in Los Angeles is, you know, the, the housing shortage there is really severe. So yeah. we could give a voucher to everyone in Southern California, but there's just no apartments for them to use it in. And this is why we believe we have to pursue both options at once. We have to both expand the supply of housing and then also expand um, vouchers and other supports that help people pay for housing. Yes. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to getting more involved with your organization. Thank you. Thank you. We're so glad to have you as a member. Thank you. I think we got one more question. Yeah. Okay, um, two more, I think. Oh, two more, okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, go, go ahead, Sydney. Yeah, okay. I was like, I can, it was a while back, so I just wanted to make sure we answered it, but it came from Dustin and he asked how um, a COC or an organization can learn more about becoming a state partner for the Opportunity Starts at Home campaign. Um, for Opportunity Starts at Home, we've got organizations that receive grants, but we've also got organizations that receive endorsements. Um, and uh, Dustin, I'm happy to talk to you um, individually just kind of about uh, what would work for your organization. It is mostly statewide organizations, more so than COCs, but local organizations can be considered to be formally involved. Um, so, I mean, really the first step is just having a conversation with one of the organizers. Um, and then very likely the second step is uh, having a conversation with the opportunity starts at home staff, uh, Mike Kaprowski or Chantel Wilkinson. Cool. And then I think the other question that I saw came from Michael Robeck, who asked, how does NLIHC distinguish it itself from intermediaries and advocates that have grown up over decades supporting light tech housing as a primary motivation on policy and on practice? Um, that's kind of a delicate question. There are a lot of groups that really push hard for the low income housing tax credit. And look, you know, we've seen a lot of organizations throughout the country who use the low income housing tax credit um, to really achieve important um, housing, um, housing outcomes um, for people with the deepest needs. But it's also true that there are a lot of people who use the low income housing tax credit um, in ways that are less targeted and less helpful. And that's why, as you kind of went through the presentation today, um, you heard us talk mostly about the National Housing Trust Fund and public housing as programs that we really support as housing supply, um, more so than the low-income housing tax credit. We're supportive of the low-income housing tax credit. There's a really good, good bill in Congress called the Affordable Housing Credit Improvement Act that expands the low-income housing tax credit, but also does improvement improve it. And uh, a lot of those improvements are things that would make it uh, easier for the low income housing tax credit to serve extremely low income households. And so um, we're really actively in support of that bill. Um, but our, our focus really is on the National Housing Trust Fund. And I, I guess that's um, the biggest distinction. Great. And we have one more raised hand. Um, Paula, do you want to come off mute and ask a question? Yes, hi, good afternoon, everybody. I had a question, uh, Joey mentioned earlier about um, senior housing, low-income seniors and housing and disabilities. Um, my mother, um, who had a stroke in 2020, at the time of her stroke, she uh, was she had a Section 8 voucher and was living in an apartment independently. Um, her stroke made her unable to live independently, she needed an aid. And um, the Medicare would not pay for her to go to an assisted living because they don't pay for room and board. Um, Medicaid would not pay for a full-time aid for her to remain in her home. And 
Um, so she had to forfeit her voucher and, um, and now um, like all but $50 of her social security income goes towards her care. Are the, uh, is, um, um, are, do you guys have any things in the works to help um, seniors be able to retain their vouchers so they can, um, so they can be augmented with medical services um, from other entities so they can remain in their homes? Um, so, so first of all, Paul, I'm sorry that your mother went through this and that's the reality that you're faced with. Um, I will say that there, there are plenty of things in um, vouchers or in public housing that need to be improved. And a lot of that got done in the Housing Opportunities Through Modernization Act that passed about six years ago. Um, what you're describing sounds like something um, where maybe the program was administered incorrectly. Um, but it's technical enough that actually um, what I would do for you in this situation is not actually answer your question, but connect you to the people at leading age um, or some of the other groups that works more specifically on housing for people with senior citizens so that you could get um, a much more precise answer than we can provide you. And that might just be an example of another thing that you get through your membership is that, um, yeah, there's a lot of expertise that we bring, but there's other moments where the best thing we can do is to connect you to someone who can provide you with a better answer than we can. And I think that's really, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, in this situation, I think that's probably the best thing to do. Um, so please follow up with myself or Courtney and, and we can move forward on that. Okay, thank you. All right, I think those are all the questions that we had. Um, Sid, were there any more? That's, that's all I saw. But if you see that your um, question wasn't answered, feel free to reach out to us after too. Yes, I just dropped all of our emails in the chat. Thank you so much to everyone for coming. Um, it's really great to meet so many of our new members. And thank you again to our panel for, for being on here and talking about what it's like to be a long-term really committed member and what we can all aspire towards. So please feel free to reach out to any of us. We'll be sending out all these resources within the next few days. And yeah, just thank you for making the time to learn more about NLIHC. And Amber, I see you put in the chat that you're trying to save all the sites. Um, 